One for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't treasurer. be scared. The the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day. And welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains big economic issues in plain English. I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. For this episode of Follow the Money, we'll be listening to an interview I did as part of a series of webinars hosted by the Australia Institute's Nordic Policy Centre as part of Nordic Talks. Nordic Talks brings together experts to discuss global challenges with a focus on Nordic policy. More than a decade after the Gonski review into Australia's school funding aimed to reduce the impact of social disadvantage on educational outcomes, outcomes for Australian school children are getting worse. The success of Finnish educational outcomes shows that equity really drives excellence for all students. So how can Australia learn from Finland to put equity at the heart of our education system? I spoke with Pazi Solberg, Professor of Education at Southern Cross University, and Karina Haythorpe, Federal President of the Australian Education Union. And joining me today are our two expert panellists, Pazi Solberg and Karina Haythorpe. Pazi is a Finnish educator, teacher and author. He's worked as a school teacher, teacher educator, academic and policymaker in Finland, and he has advised schools and education system leaders right around the world. His 2013 book, Finnish Lessons, What the World Can Learn from Educational Change in Finland, won the Grawmeyer Award in the United States for an idea that has the potential to change the world. He's currently a professor in education at Southern Cross University in Lismore. And Karina Haythorpe is federal president of the Australian Education Union, uh, a role she began in 2015. She spent 17 years teaching in public primary schools. Most of her teaching has been in low-income areas of northern Adelaide and Port Pirie in regional South Australia. But she's also taught in the UK and Japan. And as president of the AU, she led the union through a long-running industrial dispute with the South Australian government, as well as organising the I Give Agonski campaign, as well as the Stop TAFE Cuts campaigns. Today, we are going to talk a lot about equity in education, and I thought it would be useful for us to begin with a little explanation of what we mean when we say equity. Firstly, it is important to state that equality of opportunity is not the same as equity, but sometimes equity and equality are used as if the terms are synonymous. They are, however, distinct. Uh, As Pazi Solberg has written, equality of opportunity does little to address wide inequalities in learning outcomes. And there is nothing wrong with providing equality of opportunity, but equity is something different. Ten years ago, the Gonski Review divined equity as ensuring that differences in educational outcomes are not the result of differences in wealth, income, power or possessions. But Pazi Solberg, if I can start with you, you've recently written that this definition of equity from the Gonski Review probably needs to combine equality of access and equality of outcomes. How do you define equity and why is equity important to have a goal as a goal in education policy? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ebony. And it's a, it's a pleasure to sit down virtually with uh, Corina to talk about this very important thing. I also want to say that it's extremely important that we start these conversations with this uh, this question that you were asking, uh, that what are we talking about? Too often we include uh, equity in education as, a, as an idea um, or goal without being very clear about what we what we are talking about. For example, it's often uh, often believed that equity uh, actually is same as equality of opportunity that we just make sure that every child has a opportunity to <clears throat> choose the school that they the parents or, or the students uh, want to have and as you said that this uh, this is not a necessary uh, condition at all so there has been a, a significant amount of work recently about trying to clarify the um the what we mean by equity first of all i think it's very important 
to um, keep in mind that in many of these conversations, certainly what we what we're going to have today, equity in education uh, often refers to outcomes. So equity of outcomes, and that's an important thing. Of course, there are different different aspects like equity of uh, funding or resources or, um, or or curriculum or something something like this. But I think the my definition for equity in education is uh, built around this idea of uh, equity of outcomes. And there we can see, we can, we can include two different dimensions. One is the, what we in our work has uh, called an individual goal or dimension of equity that, uh, that requires that everybody, all the children or students will accomplish or achieve a certain level of education um, or adequate education as it is sometimes called for example here in australia we could say that all young people should have at least 12 years of education not necessarily the same type of education but 12 years of schooling that will then allow them to live a good healthy and, and prosperous life of their own choosing so this adequate uh, education is one dimension uh, that we make sure that each and every child as, or student will learn what they need to know and be able to do to live a good life. Then the other dimension is the, what we often call the social uh, dimension, the social equity, that requires that the, the education outcomes, uh, whatever they are, not necessarily just literacy and numeracy, it can be something else as well, are similar across the different equity or social groups. For example, uh, rural and urban and uh, up original students and and um, uh, the rest are immigrant students uh, or those who are not speaking English and those who uh, are English speakers and that the, the the learning outcomes the distribution of these learning outcomes across these different social or equity groups uh, are similar so if we if we include these two conditions this adequate education and the social equity uh, into this definition of equity of outcomes I think we are much closer to to have an understanding of equity in education that will lead to more precise conversations and conclusions also, what do we need to do? You also asked why this is important. I think equity is simply, firstly, it's important because it's a human right issue. It's, it's something that we all should be concerned about that every, that we need to include every, every single child into these conversations when we talk about education, that everybody must be uh, on the same bus, so to speak. But then the other uh, other thing why equity is such an important thing is that we, we know from evidence and research that those education systems, whether they are states or nations like we have here, uh, uh, where the equity has been deliberately um, uh, brought as a, as a policy priority, they seem to do well also better in um, uh, in terms of quality or, or excellence. So that's why we, we today we say that uh, equity in education and quality or excellence in education walk hand in hand. You're going to have either of those without the, the, the other. And that's why I think our policies need to be much more clear about how we build this uh, connection between equity and excellence. Yeah, Karina, if I can come to you next, um, do you have a similar view of equity and how do we account for equity in the Australian system currently? Is it well understood? Yes, uh, look, thanks, Ebony. And firstly, can I just acknowledge that I'm joining uh, today from uh, Bunwurrung country here, uh, land of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to the elders, uh, past and present, as always was and always will be. Uh, their land and certainly the issue of equity uh, is something that we, we've just spent uh, the last two days talking about with our Galaki Elend Committee, which is the Committee of Leadership of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, for our union and, you know, the impact of um, disadvantage and compound disadvantage that is the lived experience of so many um, of our students uh, and members. So in terms, of, I'm, I'm very interested in Parsi's um, comments around equity and the fact that um, uh, I would agree with is that we do not have a, de a clear definition of equity um, here in Australia. We welcomed the uh, findings of the Gonski Review and, and certainly, you know, the comments around equity and the need for a greater investment in particular cohorts to ensure that they had equity of access, equity of opportunity, uh, equity of resourcing. But it's the lived experience of our members, unfortunately, that that's been a major policy failing um, here in Australia. It's been a major fiscal uh, failing. And indeed, if you look to the OECD, they're very clear 
in terms of the fact that when you have um, uh, funding that is equitably uh, distributed across uh, the system, across sectors, that that is, um, you know, there's a direct correlation there to uh, the high achievement uh, in terms of educational outcomes. So uh, from our perspective, this is, it's interwoven uh, with funding and resourcing. We cannot separate the two issues. And the lived experience of our members, of course, is that um, we cater for all students, regardless of their background, uh, of their specific needs. And it is the public uh, system that, uh, in fact, does the heavy lifting uh, and has the greatest cohort of students who come from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds and uh, particularly those uh, cohorts of students that were referenced in the uh, original Bonsky review when that was handed down almost over a decade ago now. Um, but the reality is, of course, that the resources have been denied for those students and that has a deep impact on uh, equity uh, uh, in Australia. Yeah, Karina, I wonder if I might just keep with Gonski for a little while, because that is obviously kind of the biggest thing of, of recent years that has happened in, in education. Um, the, the whole idea around the Gonski review was to introduce needs-based sector-blind funding, mm -hmm. uh, and it really was to address that um, a gap of equity in outcomes that Parsi has been talking about for, between disadvantaged students and their more privileged peers. Um, but where are we on those Gonski reforms? What type of disadvantaged um, students are we talking about in the system and how are they going in terms of um, their educational outcomes a decade after Gonski? So there's a very long story here. Uh, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and address this uh, uh, briefly. But uh, in fact, there was a promise to the children of Australia that our schools would be resourced properly. Um, we have a schooling resource standard, which is the benchmark uh, for funding. Uh, and uh, as part of that standard, um, we have loadings that recognise the disadvantage and indeed the compound disadvantage of a number of uh, cohorts of students that we work with. Uh, in 2017, um, under the then Liberal government, changes were made to the Australian Education Act, which effectively uh, jettisoned the original recommendations of the Gonski Review. Uh, an arbitrary cap of 20% was put in place on the Commonwealth's contribution uh, of that SRS, and then agreements were struck with states and territories um, which uh, effectively slowed down the path um, to 100% of that SRS for public schools across the nation. And one of the one of the tricky things in those agreements is what we call a 4% depreciation tax, which effectively allows state and territory governments to reduce their share um, to that SRS. And the direct result of that is that uh, apart from the ACT, there's not a, there's not a, a school in the nation. Um, that actually sits uh, a public school that sits at 100% of the SRS, um, while the vast majority of private schools are uh, either at or above it, and indeed all will be above it um, by at the end of this uh, round of agreements. And so for us, there's a deep vein of inequality that exists, and it plays out in our school system in terms of the national uh, workforce crisis that we're currently experiencing, uh, in terms of the um, uh, lack of support that we believe should be in place for students who have a disability uh, or, you know, who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, background or live in rural and remote locations or live in poverty uh, or whose first language is not English. And this, you know, uh, really impacts on what schools can do to support those students. And uh, a, a big shout out to all of our members and the fantastic teachers and principals uh, and support staff across the nation because they are working in incredibly difficult circumstances at the moment, um, ensuring that they deliver a high quality public education but they do not have the resources to do that properly. Yeah, um, I'm sure we'll keep coming back to funding, but Parthi, I wanted to come to you now again with the, the kind of the Finnish experience um, uh, and we might come back to resourcing, but can you just give us a bit of an explanation about how Finland performs in terms of those educational outcomes and, and equity? And I wonder if you can talk to us about what it is that we lose if education doesn't have equity in outcomes? Yeah, yeah, it's a good, another good question, uh, Ebony. And since this is a Nordic talks, I would probably begin by saying that um, uh, it, it is not just Finland, it's all the Nordic countries have very similar policies when it comes to social policies or, or 
or public policies in general and education. There are some some differences in how education is, uh, what does it look like in practice, but the, the main idea is the same, that the equity is one of the key values uh, behind the education uh, thing. Uh, your question about Finland is interesting because um, uh, the the an the answer actually uh, should have or must have two parts. One is that in the um, uh, the early on in the beginning of the time when we have had internationally comparable data about how education systems uh, perform, uh, meaning 20, uh, 10, 20 years ago. Um, Finland, as most people know, has been one of the uh, high-performing education systems when it comes to um, excellent quality of learning outcomes and also the, the equity of education outcomes. Um, and that, that's why Finland has often uh, kept as a, as a model uh, for, for others, including here in Australia. What has happened during the last 10 years uh, is decline of education performance, both in quality and equity. Interestingly, it's not just the, the PISA results that people often uh, refer to in, in, in the Finland's case, but it also the, the equity has been declining. And there are many people, including myself, who is likely to argue that the, the declining learning um, learning outcomes among our students in the OECD's PISA study is probably mostly driven by declining equity in the system. And then the question is that why the equity has been uh, going down in Finland uh, from where it used to be 20 years ago. One thing is going back to the, to the Corina's uh, talk about funding is that we have had as a consequence of the 2008 global financing crisis, we had a really serious uh, negative uh, impact on our national economy and particularly public sec sector funding uh, that always uh, uh, treat the public systems in a delay. So this was something that happened in the middle of the last, uh, last decade when the funding for schools uh, began to decline and especially funding that was meant to um, help those schools and those students who have particular uh, special educational needs. In other words, the, the, the school system today in Finland is suffering from underfunding in, um, in terms of uh, providing all the necessary support and help to those students uh, who need help. In Finland also has an increasing growing number of non-Finnish speaking students in the system that would require these additional uh, resources. So one thing that Finnish educators are quite uh, uh, quite um, on the same uh, same opinion is that the because of the the system has not been funded properly as it should ha has been before we we can see this declining equity um, in the system and because the equity is uh, uh, getting weaker, that is also having a negative impact on the, the quality or the learning outcome. Thing. So this, this is a kind of a logic in, in many ways in the system. Um, and, and your question about, um, you know, why, why equity plays an important uh, role in education policy and should play even uh, more important roles now in the post-pandemic uh, era is exactly this, that there, there will be no excellence in education without stronger equity. And uh, all the world-class education systems that Australia quite correctly desires to be uh, have followed exactly the same same thinking that there, there has to be both equity and, and excellence um, at the same time. Uh, in Finland, the policymakers and educators, uh, educators are quite clear about the situation. So it's, uh, uh, it's not something that we wouldn't know there. Uh, the the thing is that how the how the government policies and public uh, public sector funding uh, would be uh, responding to this situation uh, that has been quite dire actually in Finland during the last five years and uh, so it remains to be seen how the um, how the uh, the fund this funding system will change it's a little bit similar to the debate that we have here in Australia that the system would require more money and, and resources to um, to be able to turn back to the the stronger track. Um, Pazi, if I can stay with you, I'm just also keen to understand some of the um, features of Finland's approach from when it wasn't on the decline due to funding issues. What are some of the ways that Finland has um, put equity at the heart of its education system? Yeah, the, first, the, probably the most important thing is that it's an entirely public system. So unlike here in Australia, where we have 
number of different systems and they're differently funded. That Finland, uh, like all the Nordic countries, basically has just one public system that is much much easier to uh, to, to manage and handle. Um, um, so that's what that's one thing. And then within this public uh, public system uh, space, the the Finnish system has been like all the other Nordic systems, are very much focusing on individual students rather than. Uh, rather than um, almost like an impersonal uh, way of looking at education, which means that uh, special needs education, for example, Finland has been um, a, probably the strongest single element of this equitable system that has been able to prevent failure in the school uh, and continues to do so. But as I said earlier, uh, because of the lack of uh, resources and funding, it's harder and harder for the for the schools to do that. And then, of course, teachers are important part of the, the um, equitable system. Uh, it, it's very difficult to have equity in education without having teachers who are able to uh, keep schools going and focus on those individual needs. So I would probably add in the Finnish case as well that we have a very highly um, educated teaching force and um, uh, teachers who are widely trusted by parents and everybody else. And that means that they are able to do what they think uh, it has to be done to make sure that each and every child would be successful in the school. But there, you know, this this whole whole story about why why systems have equity or why education systems lack equity uh, is much more complicated than just looking at education. So, in in the Finnish case, for example, we also need to look at uh, other public policies like health and social policies and child policies and youth policies, uh, just like here in Australia. I think. I think believing that we can build equitable education system just by through education is is going to be difficult difficult road ahead. We need to we need to make sure that these other public policies are working with the education sector for each and every child in the system. Thank you, Karina. If I can come back to you <laughs> and the Australian context, I feel like uh, there's a lot of families across Australia that very well understood the importance of education during the pandemic when a lot of people were kind of uh, forced to be at home. Uh, And schools really are the heart of a lot of communities. And I want to pick up um, what it is that we lose if students who are coming from disadvantaged backgrounds or uh, have special needs in some way if they're not realising that potential um, in the education system, that seems to me, uh, you know, to to have very long-term consequences for Australia as a whole, Mm. not just for those lost opportunities for those um, students individually. Is that the case? Yeah, look, that's a a very big question. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Uh, Look, I... I, uh, I've talked about this um, uh, sometimes with our members about the fact that, you know, as teachers, we actually hold the future of humanity in our hands because the work that we do uh, in public schools across the nation actually creates, you know, a just uh, democratic society. We teach our children how to be um, part of a community, how to stand up for their rights, um, and, uh, you know, a, a significant part of that is respect for each other and respect for the people who live in our community who come from diverse backgrounds. And it it saddens me that um, in Australia we now, we have a funding system that uh, has such deep inequality that those children who need the greatest respect from our governments and our bureaucracies, um, children that you've mentioned and that we've talked about uh, already, are denied the support that they need to be successful at school. Um, uh, Even though uh, 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 when we survey our members, we know that principals in schools, excuse me, (coughs) are taking funding from other parts of their budget to meet the shortfalls. Um, You know, I I think just imagine, just imagine if we could deliver the promise that was uh, made to the Australian community around Gonski funding and indeed was a commitment of the ALP going into the last election to ensure that every school was funded uh, at 100% of uh, the schooling resource standard. Just imagine how life-changing that would be, not only for our kids, but also for Australia as a community more broadly. Mm. We're going to go very shortly to questions from the audience. 
Um, but Karina, if I can stay with you, I'm wondering um, what lessons do you think Australia can learn from the Finnish example when it comes to putting equity more at the heart of our education system? And I guess I'm not thinking just of resources, but mm. I guess differences in the approach to education. Look, I think we can learn a lot uh, from Finland and um, I've had lots of conversations with my colleague Parsi uh, about this over the years. Um, we, are, we are part of a system and having strong system support is critically important for um, our members uh, with their work. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we can learn from Finland is the investment in the workforce um, the uh, also the investment in making sure that initial teacher education is a huge uh, priority and that teaching is respected and seen as a genuine career option for uh, for young people and also for you know uh, I guess midlife uh, midlife career uh, changes as well and currently we're having a, a, a discussion in Australia around the workforce crisis that we know is impacting on our schools across the country. And uh, Minister Jason Clare has been leading a, a process nationally around the development of a workforce action plan. And as part of um, that plan, uh, there is indeed a move to um, prioritise initial teacher education and also to deal with some of the workload issues and other workforce issues that, um, uh, that we are facing. And I think there is much to be learned from Finland. But I would just say, Ebony, you, you cannot separate the issue of funding. And um, PISA, uh, PISA data shows that um, we are, uh, you know, amongst the worst nations uh, as part of, um, uh, you know, the, the 77 sort of PISA countries uh, in terms of investment for equity, uh, not only in, in teacher resources, but also in material resources. Uh, and we invest significantly lower than countries such as Finland, uh, Norway and Sweden. So I think there's much to be learned there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Parsi, I know you've written about um, different ways that we can put equity at the heart of education. I do wonder if you could just talk me through some of those ideas that you've been putting out into the public space um, about ways to achieve equity in education. What are some of those ideas that, that you've talked about? Uh, yeah, can I just uh, say one thing? I think a fair question would also be that what what Finland can learn from uh, from Australia before I was we, going to get to uh, that. Okay, yeah, but, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, because I I think it's a good to continue from what Corinna was saying. I, I think it's very important for everybody who is following this uh, webinar and conversation to understand that we can always learn from one another. And I'm I'm definitely one of those who is always looking for these opportunities. That uh, all the education systems, wherever they are, that they, they can also both learn from others, but and, and then also say what they do. You know, I've been here now in this country for four years, and I, I, I guess I've seen enough to be able to say something about, you know, how things are here. And I often tell my, my colleagues and friends uh, back home in Nordic countries that when they ask about uh, my views about the Australian education system, that I think that we have the best education in the world here, but it's not for everyone. And that's our, our challenge, that the most interesting and innovative schools that we have any, I've seen anywhere, actually here in Australia, everywhere, and they are public schools and uh, they are rural and um, remote schools and independent schools and Catholic schools, all kinds of uh, uh, places where people do amazing things. And, and that's something that uh, certainly my colleagues in Finland are interested in seeing, that how do you, how, how do you kind of uh, build a, a future-looking, uh, uh, interesting, inspiring place for young people to learn where they, where they can really cultivate and, and discover their own strengths and, and futures. So that's certainly one thing that, that uh, uh, Australia has a lot to offer for, for uh, others. Uh, but also, you know, the, the fact that we, we have a very segregated education system in general here. Segre social segregation means that um, that we have public schools, for example, uh, are catering 85% of our most disadvantaged students and 85% of our indigenous kids as well. Um, and those are the places where a lot of a lot of lessons can be taken from other places like Finland. That is such as basically learning learning how to how to run the school with such a uh, wide diversity of uh, of students. Uh, so so those are the things that some of those things that Finland certainly uh, can and, and has been learning already from you know what's happening here and everybody should keep in mind that 
uh, you know, what, what you read in media or hear people saying about the horrible uh, situation in our education here in Australia is not, not necessarily the full story, that there are a lot of strengths and, and positive things that we need to build on uh, as well. Um, can I Bonnie, also respond to your question about this equity? What, uh, what, need, what should be or could be done? Because I think it's a very important uh, question also for this conversation that what, what the, the, the schools or communities um, all leaders can do with the equity. I, I think it all starts with this, what, how we started this webinar here, yeah, that the first thing is really to make sure that we, we talk about same things, because if, we are not, if we're talking about different things, uh, when it comes to equity in education, not much will, will happen. And it's, a, it's the same thing here as a nation. And now when the, the government is, uh, uh, is uh, deciding this new uh, national school reform um, agreement, you know, if in that agreement, we do not have a commonly said uh, understanding of what equity in education means, we're going to have another uh, period of time when not much will happen when it comes to equity. So that's why at the school level or individual level is a very important thing to do. Second thing I think is uh, equally important is that every teacher and principal, uh, every school realizes that they, they, they you cannot fix these inequalities in Australian education uh, system or society alone. You, you, you need to understand that it takes... Uh, it's take a kind of a wider, uh, wider approach. Uh, other public uh, sector policies, particularly health and, and social issues, to work with, um, and and then uh, kind of a figure out what is the role uh, role of the school. Uh, at the school level, I think the probably the best thing that individual school or, or teacher can do is to um, first of all try to adapt as much as possible the what we call the uh, whole child uh, approach. To education, so that the, when 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 we are looking at children in our schools, that it's not just uh, literacy and numeracy that we are concerned about. That it's a whole child, including well-being and health and, and many other things um, that are important things when we are um, when we are looking at what the outcomes of the schooling uh, schooling would be, and then uh, try to build uh, wherever you can a kind of an individual more individual approach to educating students. An individual approach here doesn't necessarily mean that we, everybody has to have an individual plan or, or program, that it, but it means that we more and more understand these individual needs that young people have when they come to school. And as we all know that uh, some children have much more severe and, and complicated needs when it comes to being successful or learning in school than the others. And that's why um, when Corina was talking about the importance of teachers and teacher education, it's such an important thing that we have teachers in our schools who are able to understand these individual needs and understand why they play such an important role when we are seeking more equitable education here in Australia. Um, and Karina, finally, I'm going to ask you both, but I'll start with you. Um, given that we are here talking about equity in education, what's one thing that viewers today, and we've got about 350 people on the line with us today, what's one thing that you think we could all take from today and, and start doing to support equity in education? Well, join us in the campaign. We've got an, uh, we've got an election commitment um, that's not yet been met uh, by the ALP uh, in that they will uh, deliver a pathway to 100% for all students, you know, for all, pu all public schools in particular. Um, we're yet to see what that's going to look like. And so uh, any, uh, any conversations, um, you know, text messages, emails that people can send and talk to um, their local members about how important this is um, and certainly, uh, you know, sending letters to the PM would be very helpful as well. Um, we need to we need to see the realisation of this promise. It was a it was a commitment that was made to our students and to our children. And we've had an entire decade of children who have gone through schooling now without seeing um, the full uh, implementation of the Gonski recommendations. We've got a real opportunity with the National School Reform Agreement process, which is coming up. Um, negotiations are due to begin at the end of this year. And um, that next four year agreement can deliver the funding that our schools need and it can start to address the equity issues and indeed support um, all children uh, to access a high quality public education. That's critically important to us and we'll be campaigning um, on that issue. And I would urge anyone that's interested to, um, to join us and have those conversations with their local MPs. And uh, we'll go to questions straight after this. But Parsi, you too, what key action point would you want people to take away from today uh, to support equity in education? Yeah, actually, I, I 
steal Corinna, I steal your idea and uh, mm -hmm. say that you know if you if you um, can find a campaign to join, start a campaign, start a movement in your own community about talking about these things because there's no other uh, better place, a better way to do what we need to do than you know start from home and uh, from you know talking about these things with your your friends and communities and your own schools, you know, asking these questions of what is equity, why is it important and, and what we can do about it. There are such important ways to um, start a movement and, and then uh, then join the campaign. I often uh, I try to avoid a kind of a giving three things that you need to do or you can do because uh, they are often things that some people agree uh, with and some people can do and, and many others don't. What we all can do is to have deeper and, and more kind of a uh, focused conversations uh, and debates, particularly now when we have a holiday season, of course, everybody should go to the beach and have their barbie and enjoy the the the, the, the kind of a well-deserved um, um, holiday. But this is also an opportunity for us to sit down and um, and, and get into this conversation about equity, uh, education and, and what type of schooling do we want to have here and see in, in the um, in the future in Australia? And big part of the conversation, of course, is uh, the question that how do we make sure that we do not continue to have the world class uh, schooling for some students and some kids here in Australia? But how do we make uh, have a system that is uh, equal and fair and inclusive for each and everyone? Mm. Um, well, we'll with that go to questions from the audience. And as I said, we've got about 350 people uh, online with us today. So don't forget, you can type your question into the Q&A box uh, if you've got one there. Um, the first question I want to ask is from Bernie McComb. Uh, and I'll ask both of you to address this. Um, one pertains to Finland and the other to Australia. Um, so Bernie asks, is it true that schools in Finland are a maximum size of 400 students? And what do you think about schools in Australia that have up to 2,000 students or more? So Pazi, I might put that to you first about the size of schools in Finland. Yeah, no, it's not true. Uh, and I, I do think that, you know, the large schools like 2,000 students is uh it's it's probably too too big we don't have any in finland we don't have any schools that would be 2000 but that you know the trend there has been uh, that the size of schools um, have been growing and now we have few schools that are have more than 1000 students and you know many people there if you go and talk to teachers or principals they think that it's a quite a quite a lot of uh, students but yeah yeah there's no there's no um no such a limit as 400 yeah. Um, Karina, that uh, question around school sizes here, do you have a, uh, anything to kind of contribute on that in particular? I think the issue is less uh, about school size and more about class size. Um, you know, our members will tell you that uh, uh, that we're seeing increasing complex, uh, class complexity in terms of um, the students that they're working with. And yet, you know, many of our, uh, our classes are uh, around 30 or even more. And it, it's always rather amusing when I meet um, politicians or other commentators who say, look, class size doesn't matter. Uh, and then you discover that their children are attending a private school that's got a class size of 17 or 18. And I think, well, it might not matter in your school and in your context, but it certainly matters in our context. And um, that capacity to have a reduced um, uh, class size actually enables more time for the teacher to spend with all students, but particularly those students who require additional help. So I would say rather than the school itself, let's actually focus on the issue of classes. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next question that I've got is uh, around funding. It's from Pamela Collette, and she says... How can there be uh, equity when private schools receive more funds than public schools? Um, Karina, I wonder if you might tackle that one first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's absolutely right. And that's what, 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 why, why I guess we've been campaigning now for a very long time in terms of addressing inequality. Um, since 2017, this, this really escalated, um, uh, particularly um, when Scott Morrison was Prime Minister. We've seen over $10 billion worth of special deals that were um, just passed on to the private sector. Um, you know, a $1.9 billion capital works fund at the same time as the public um, uh, school capital works fund was dismantled by um, the Commonwealth Government. And, you know, it, it's just, I think it is really just the greatest shame uh, 
um, of our nation that we that we have um, this disparity in terms of funding from our campaigning perspective um, you know I don't represent members in private schools I represent members in public schools and we very much focus on the importance of ensuring that all of our schools um, reach a hundred percent of the um, of that SRS but uh, it's particularly galling um, when you know that um, uh, that we have uh, two other sectors which are funded um, over and above the SRS um, while our students are denied that resourcing. Yeah, Parsi, you've said that uh, Finland in particular is an entirely public system. What are your observations there on the equity when private schools are receiving greater resourcing than public schools? You mean here in Australia, yes? Yeah, in the Australian. Yeah, well, yeah no, uh, Corinna said said it, I, I think, well, um, that I, I agree. Um, I think it's particularly difficult to accept for somebody like myself who came from the Nordic space here four years ago to to see that we continue to have almost all, all, all the public schools underfunded at the same time when government taxpayers' money is going to school, uh, non-government schools that don't actually need that. And, and that's, you know, if we were an extremely wealthy country and all the public schools had what they need, that this would be another conversation, but you know, as long as we continue to have public schools uh, underfunded, I, I think it's also a moral question of or ethical um, uh, issue that why why do we allow something like this? Uh, and and for me, as a Nordic person, it's very difficult to understand why this can be the situ- continue to be the situation like this. Um, I've got a question next here from Lee Bartlett, and I might put it to you first, Parsi, because I think it responds to something that you mentioned. Um, uh, Lee says, we have three of the most vulnerable areas in Victoria in the region that they're from. The equity needs to be considered across the ecosystem that supports the child, not only within school, but especially for families who are not connecting with schools. And Lee's question is, is there examples of how school family partnerships work in Finland or that whole child, I guess, response that you were talking about earlier, Parsi? Yeah, it's an extremely important uh, thing. And I'm actually working, doing a little bit of research and and development work in in my Victorian colleagues now in trying to trying to build this health and education closer partnership in that. My, my, my answer to this great question would be that um, I, I think in the Finnish case and in the Nordic countries in general, uh, these issues are much more carefully taken care by these other public policies that I've been referring before. Uh, that we, do, we we try to kind of make sure that education policy would not education would not just be a kind of an isolated island or, or, or silo in the society, but the, the the other policies would support uh, all the children. Uh, we have uh, separate youth and child policies as well um, that will help these communities. So when the when the parents and um, uh, and the community in general comes into this play, that they they also they are able to do that within the the framework of network kind of a network public uh, public uh, policies. Um, in the Finnish uh, system, it's not a perfect way to do, but I think that it helps people to to understand that that often uh, the support that individual students and children need to be su- in order to be successful in the school uh, are the things that schools are not necessarily able to provide. For example, health and well-being issues, and increasingly now after the pandemic, I think that the, the well-being and health are critically important things. And that's why it's so important that in the, at the level of the community, also these other sectors like a health uh, are integrated in the, the, um, uh, the education. That makes also it easier for uh, the, the people in the community and com- community in general to, to be part of the, the work of the schools. Yeah, Karina, uh, I, I, it's a really good point that schools alone aren't going to solve inequity problems. Um, but Do you have any observations there? I'm thinking in the Australian context, um, I was listening recently to a podcast on the ABC about Victoria, for example, placing um, a a lawyer to help families out with legal concerns or things like placing counsellors and and other kind of wraparound services near a school community. Um, How much is that a feature of Australia's education system at the moment? And, yeah, if you could just talk about, I guess, how the community fits into solving that equity problem. Mm, yeah, it's a, another good question. I think, uh, you know, the comment schools alone uh, uh, not 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 solving equity um, issues is 
really important because actually we're not alone, we're part of a system and it's the department's responsibility or the bureaucrats, you know, bureaucracy's responsibility to provide the resources that we need. One of the uh, benefits of the first four years of Gonski funding rolling out into our schools was that many schools were able to use that resource to put in place um, uh, occupational therapists or speech therapy or, uh, you know, mental health um, provision um, and supporting, you know, supporting our students um, uh, um, across the board was, was just so critically important, not just in terms of literacy and numeracy intervention, but, intervention, but sort of, you know, for the, for the other things that um, can impact on a student's um, learning and indeed their lives. And the community is such an important part of this, of course, because um, education is about a partnership between, uh, between schools and between families and, you know, caregivers and, and the community and having that close connection. I'm a primary school teacher, so uh, from my, you know, from my uh, personal experience having that strong connection with parents uh, as part of their um, students' education is critically important. Uh, and um, I think I think there are uh, there are uh, mechanisms that can be put in place if we have the resourcing, you know, around this whole notion of I guess birth to twelve provision around having Parsi mentioned the importance of having conversations with the health sector and other sectors to uh, you know to address some of the um, uh, health and social. Uh, services that our children need as well but that requires the will of governments it requires the will of systems to deliver the resources uh, and I, we, we see that very much as a joint commonwealth and state and territory responsibility. Hmm. Uh, the next question that I've got uh, is probably for you Parsi it's from Meredith Doig and uh, they ask how does the relative homogeneity of Finland contribute to equitable education outcomes or I guess how much does it um I think you're referring there to there is more um uh students without a Finnish speaking background entering the educational system can you just have a a, a response to to that question please yeah it's a great and important question as well that the 20 years ago the I think it was quite fair to say that Finland was a homogeneous uh country in in many respects but that's not the case the situation um, any longer particularly the larger urban um, cities and towns are quite diverse so we are we are having the same types of uh, challenges and and also the richness that comes through the the, the cultural diversity that many other countries uh, have now i think uh, equally important is the the social economic diversity that is there that we have Finland and all the Nordic countries uh, have been known for for a long time about it, uh, because of their very low child poverty rates um, and the the, the income uh, in, in inequalities as well that has been very very different to compare to uh, Australia for example or many other countries. But these things are changing as well that we we are having we are seeing more uh, kind of an income uh, inequality which means that the the distribution of wealth is not as even and fair as it used to be. Um, and, and certainly we have more children living in poverty, coming to school from uh, very disadvantaged backgrounds uh, today compared to what it was 10 or 20 years ago. And, and, and so this, it's not just this cultural um, uh, diversity of the, the things that come with the migration or immigration. It's also the, the, the society is becoming unfair, unfortunately. And, and that's uh, one of those things that the Finnish policymakers and current government, for example, and all the Nordic governments are very well aware uh, of and they try to work on this. But this uh, socioeconomic uh, uh, disparities now in the societies is a big driver of these education in, uh, in inequities as well. Mm. Um, Karina, I wonder if I might put that same question to you, but in a different way. Uh, Australia uh, is very proud of its multicultural history. We're about to go to a referendum next year for an Indigenous voice to Parliament. Um, I guess I want to talk about, I uh, wonder if you could talk about um, how much of a strength that is of Australia's education system that we do have a wide diversity of students and backgrounds and cultures that all contribute to uh, the public education system. 
it's a huge strength and it's one that we're very proud of um, in terms of ensuring that um, all children, uh, you know, no matter their background or uh, uh, circumstances, have access to a high quality education. Um, and as I said previously, um, it is through public education that we actually get to uh, develop our nation and, you know, make sure that um, our children understand their roles as citizens, uh, not only of Australia, but also globally, um, and the, that they uh, are able to to respect uh, diversity and understand what it's like to live in such a diverse community um, that we have here. But it does add a layer of complexity that our members um, are dealing with. You know, we've got a, a, a number of students from a refugee or asylum seeking background who need extra support, um, uh, particularly with English, uh, and also might uh, uh, have particular wellbeing needs, depending on the circumstances that they've been through. Um, many of our students experience compound disadvantage. They will go across the across the loadings um, in terms of where they live or, um, you know, uh, if they have a disability and so on. Um, so that adds to the complexity of our classes and it's why, why we campaign so hard for the resources to be delivered because it's through the additional um, teachers and personnel uh, and support programs in schools that we can make sure that all of those children are well supported for their education uh, and that is life-changing not only for their experience at school but also for their outcomes as members of our community um, after school. It's life-changing in terms of the justice system uh, and it's also life-changing in terms of health uh, and well-being and just a reflection um, on these last couple of years of COVID uh, that, that actually has had a deep impact for students and their well-being and we know that many of our uh, members are dealing with that um, firsthand in terms of supporting students um, who, uh, you know, have been seriously uh, unwell and socially isolated throughout that time. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful part of the public education system, but it also uh, has an impact and has a great responsibility for us all. Yeah, uh, Karina, I wonder if I might just ask you following up from that, and I'm not sure if this is necessarily um, in your wheelhouse, so feel free to uh, move on to the next question if um, if it's not, but it strikes me that a difference between Finland and Australia, um, not just in terms of some of the, the aspects that we've been looking at, but Australia is a massive country. I'm imagining that um, remote learning is a bigger part of the Australian education system um, than it might be for many other countries. Um, during the pandemic, when people were doing a lot of learning online, um, was that useful actually for the Australian education system to have a, a little section of it that was used to kind of, I guess, doing things online or via radio? And and how much does um, remoteness and and those schools who experience remoteness have to teach the rest of the the education system after the pandemic? I think that's a bit of a yes and no question, uh, actually. Um, uh, I, I've, I've got personal experience with um, Outback Education uh, in South Australia, you know, delivered through um, Port Augusta, uh, meeting with members there. Um, so, you know, we are a geographically remote um, country. There's no doubt about it. And uh, as you say, you know, there has been, you know, via radio or online delivery. What the pandemic has taught us is that there is no replacement for the teacher, there is no replacement for face-to-face -face learning. And uh, I think, you know, it's probably finally put to bed uh, this notion that teachers can be re re replaced by computers and we can all move to a, 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 a digital world. Certainly um, uh, there is, uh, uh, I think, genuine opportunity to, um, you know, to engage in, in uh, sort of an online uh, learning, but it should never be used as replacement for the teacher. Uh, and the experience of our members is that as students have returned to face-to-face -face teaching environments, um, you know, the, the social interaction the, the capacity to collaborate together in small groups just cannot be um, underestimated how important that is to their education. And um, uh, I guess from my personal experience of uh, having a daughter who tried to do two years of university in front of a computer has been that, you know, that, that's been incredibly frustrating. And in fact, she's taken, a, a, taken, taken time off because um, she's not, in fact, met any, anyone else in her course. So um, I, I don't think it's ever going to replace teaching. Uh, and, and I might be waffling a bit there, so I'll stop now. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, I was also um, going to move on to the, the next question, which was about uh, from Sabina um, Padawaran. 
uh, who said that um, Sabina is a recent high school graduate. And the question is, does the selective school system in New South Wales and Victoria play into the inequality that we see in the education system? And would it be more equitable um, if we went without them? Karina, I might put that one to you first. I thought you were going to put that one to me. Um, Look, I think it would be inappropriate for me to um, make reflections on that. I mean, my role as federal president is to deal with national issues, so I don't uh, normally deal with the state-based issues, and that's a very direct question about, um, you know, education delivery in New South Wales uh, and in Victoria. So I'll I'll pass on that one. Thanks, Ebony. No worries. Parsi, are selective schools a feature of the Finnish education system? Uh, Yes, there's a selection selection but only in high school senior high school so all, all the way until year, year nine the schools are what we call comprehensive schools and the assumption is that the, all the students will go to their neighborhood school and that there's no uh, there's no selection but the high school the, the senior secondary education is based on students own choice excellent uh we've probably got uh time for one more question and there's yeah a whole bunch of questions in here around funding and resourcing. Um, So we can't address all of them. Um, But Parsi, I wonder if I can put to you first in terms of those resourcing issues that you were talking about before, what is it that Australia needs to do um, in the near future um, to put equity at the heart of education when it comes to resourcing schools? I think we had we had a fairly good plan 10 years ago with the Konsky review that, that basically uh, laid the 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 foundation for the idea that there should be a fair funding for for schools based on their needs. And I think that you know, although there are some things that obviously needs to be updated in the Konsky's uh, initial review uh, thing, but you know, this this would be a good starting point uh, for the um, for the funding review. And I, I think that this is really what we do need. It's it's uh, difficult to for me to imagine that we are able to again, have a uh, world-class school system for each and every Australian child if we continue to uh, spend money um, on education and schools as we do right now. uh, This funding has to be seen much more as an investment on people rather than spending on on schools that don't necessarily need that. And that's why I think, um, you know, we don't need to invent uh, new ideas. We just need to... uh, in Australia to go back to some of these conversations and ideas that have been done before and just update them. Uh, I, I think we have seen already enough uh, reviews and uh, commissions and, and reports in this country with uh, very little uh, impact or, or change in the system. And now I think it's time to take these things to, to heart and, and make sure that we we do what people people really want to do uh, here. And, and we, we also know that, uh, for example, from my own or our own research and, and work here in Australia, the most people actually, most Australians would like to have a more equitable and fair education system. Uh, that this, this is a, it's not true if somebody says that, you know, this is what people want. This is not what people want. This is what some people want to have a, thing, a system like this. But most of us here in this country, we would like to see um, education systems as they are in, you know, many other advanced uh, nations, you know, in, including uh, places like Canada or Nordic countries, and and it's all within our reach if we just want to do that. Uh, and funding funding our, uh, our schools is one of those things that uh, we have to start with. And Karina, you, what's the job ahead when it comes to equity and funding? Well, it's very easy. We need to deliver the promise that was made by the Gonski Review to our children, um, and that is to achieve at least 100% of the school and resource standard. The um, the SRS is actually a benchmark that's well understood. Uh, and accepted across all layers of, of politics. Um, so it's, 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 it's not the SRS that's the issue, it's the will of governments to fund it. And this has to be a joint responsibility. So the Commonwealth needs to lift their share uh, and state and territory governments need to lift their share. And while they're doing that, they also need to restore um, capital investment uh, for our schools so that public schools can have state-of-the-art infrastructure uh, and learning centres for our children across the nation. So this is achievable. It's um, uh, it, it Not only is it achievable, but it must be achieved. Uh, and we would expect that um, this is led by the PM. Uh, you know, he talks about uh, his understanding of disadvantage and um, you know, his lived experience of that. Uh, so we would expect them to meet their commitment and get state and territories to step up and do so as well. 
Thank you so much, Parsi Solberg and Karina Haythorpe. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. This episode was recorded on Thursday, the 1st of December, 2022, and things may have changed since recording. If you liked today's episode, please rate and review us. It helps other people to find the show. And if you love the show and want to help us continue to do work with impact and influence, please consider supporting us with a small tax-deductible gift today at australiainstitute.org.au. You can find all our latest research and content at australiainstitute.org.au and we're on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. My Twitter handle is ebony underscore Bennett with a double N double T. Parsi Solberg is at Parsi, P-A-S-I underscore Solberg, S-A-H-L-B-E-R-G. Karina Haythorpe is at C Haythorpe with an E on the end, A-E-U. Our producer, Jennifer Macy, is at Jennifer Macy. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum. And with special thanks to Nordic Talks. Thanks for listening.